This is the American Law Journal. Yes, it's true. Some people do take advantage of workers' compensation, bogus injuries, malingering. But what happens when the boss or the insurance company refuses to play fair? Good evening. Welcome to the program. I'm Christopher Naughton. What do you think is worse, a person who fakes a work injury and stays on comp for years, or a boss who refuses to pay benefits to an injured worker who tumbled in a concrete pit to save a dying man's life? Gina Passarella with the Legal Intelligencer has this. As much as you need to. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And uh, don't worry about that. Uh, it cost workers me comp. No, workers comp will take care of all that. Gotcha. So you'll be all right with that. But this way you can get started right away. For as long as there's been workers comp, there's been fraud, faking injuries, malingering, even teaming up with dishonest lawyers and doctors to milk an injury. I think if you speak to some of my clients, they'll say it's a big problem. I think it's a mixed bag. I think that claimants get a bad rap, quite frankly. It's more of a myth uh, than anything else. But just go to YouTube or Google workers' comp fraud, and you will see hundreds of examples. But is that telling the whole story? The most blatant kind would be where an injury is totally fabricated. And that does happen occasionally. Three or four cases I get a year, the employer says, we need to contest this claim. But I would say, I think it's a rare case where you have an outright fabricated injury. And studies bear that out. Only 1 to 2 percent of workers' comp claims are fraudulent. Where you get into a gray area is if you are claiming that you're totally disabled, and then perhaps they send a private investigator out, and you're at the playground down the street with your two-year-old, oh, well, that must be fraud because, you know, they're supposed to be bedridden. Well, nobody says that. I'm sure, I don't even think the injured worker would, would claim to be bedridden. So simply because the individual is, is out doesn't mean that there's fraud involved. More often than not, I think you have the kind of case where it's just kind of extending care and extending treatment. Then we kind of feel like that's kind of uh, a malingering situation or an exaggeration of the claim. Not as serious and much more common. And sometimes it's not just the worker who demonstrates comp fraud or lack of good faith. It's the employer. One case upsetting pro-worker groups is about a man who went into a sanitation plant's methane pit to save another worker who had fallen in. The first worker died. The Good Samaritan survived, but was badly injured. He filed for comp. But the employer refused, saying the man was not acting in furtherance of the employer's business interests, and his act as a Good Samaritan was not employment-related. That case is now before the PA Supreme Court. The basic tenet of the Workers' Compensation Act is that this is a humanitarian act. And when you start interpreting rules technically and in favor of the employer or against the injured worker's rights, you're no longer interpreting this as a humanitarian act. Is workers' comp fraud a problem? It depends on which camp you ask. Insurance carriers would certainly say so. They cite to billions of dollars a year paid out for workers' comp fraud. But claimants and injured workers' support groups say reports of bogus claims and malingering are overblown. Like voter fraud or disability fraud, there's no there there. For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, four guests with me tonight, two lawyers, an investigator, and a comp judge. Let's go ahead and meet them. George Beatty has been a champion of injured people and workers' rights now for over 30 years with the law firm of Beatty, Sloan, and DeGeneva. The Honorable Todd Selig joins us once again, Pennsylvania workers' compensation judge, and in his spare time, he's an adjunct professor at Villanova Law. Lori Carroll, no never at a loss uh, for words for herself, uh, a corporate defense attorney, respondents counsel in workers' compensation with Nolte, Scar Kamaza and McDevitt. And Joe Gill returns to the program. He and his firm, Gill & Associates, conduct private investigations, including workers' comp fraud investigations. 1-800-426-4625, the number right here in the studio. If you're bashful, write to us at info at lawjournaltv.com. If you don't, get in touch with us early. We can't answer your question. Let me go, before we get to uh, some video of workers committing fraud, because we know we'll get to that tonight, I've got to go to this pipeline systems case, which is going before the Supreme Court. And again, we've got a situation where a, a man is hired by a company to go to a sanitation plant in Western PA. He sees a man fall into a concrete pit. He goes into the pit after him. 
finds out that the man is dead. He gets to the bottom. Methane gas overtakes him. He falls himself, and he doesn't die. He's injured. Comes out, he wants workers' compensation. And the employer says, no, I'm incredulous. Who's going to start, George? Uh, well, <laughs> well, incredulous is, is a kind word, Christopher. I mean, what happened here is, uh, you know, demonstrative of what these employers and these insurance companies do. It's all about the almighty dollar. The judge, the appeal board, and the Commonwealth Court have all said what this man did was in the course and scope of his job. He was on duty. But it's going he, up to the Supreme Court. It's, I know. So th this employer or the insurance company, wh whoever the case may be, they're so greedy and angry that they're actually going to take this up to the Supreme Court. I'm appalled by it. Chris, is, let me tell you. I just think this is a public relations nightmare for the employer because we love our good Samaritans here in America. I mean, there are the people that are on Oprah and on Ellen. And so we want people to be able to uh, uh, go and rescue people and help people. I understand, but here's what the employer attorney said for, for the uh, pi pipeline systems and for the insurance company, that the compensation act should not apply here to an untrained employee who is not a first responder and who is injured after abandoning his employment to engage in unsanctioned Good Samaritan activities. I'd be embarrassed to take that case, quite frankly. Actually, there was a change in the statute. In 2003, the law was amended to specifically permit this kind of thing to be covered. So it's right. even more favorable for the employee. Right. So the guy is faced with a situation, an emergency, where somebody falls down into this pit and he goes into action to try to help a fellow human being on the same job site. He's on the job, on duty when this happens. How dare they? try to make a case out of this and deny this man his life sustained. This would be a tough case for you to it, taste I it. think it would be a tough case uh, for me. And I would want to know, in this case, who actually uh, denied the employee. Was it the, uh, the uh, claims manager or was it in a, the employer uh, itself? And I was talking to uh, the judge. I think there needs to be some boundaries on how the Good Samaritan law applies, mm -hmm. because we don't want somebody to jump off a cliff, to you know, to have the cliff, to save some uh, uh, an employee who could be hanging off the cliff. So there are boundaries that this Good Samaritan law should apply. But I think in this case, I. Uh, I well, this is, exactly, this is exactly what uh, Joe Huddeman was talking about in the package, that if you go down this path, all of a sudden, workers' compensation looks like it's losing its humanity. Well, that's the whole point of workers' comp, uh, the, the law itself. In 1915, what they did, they took away a worker's right to sue his employer or her employer. Took away that right constitutionally. And now your only remedy is workers' comp. So you can't get pain and suffering in a third-party action you can. You can only get your wages and your medical bills and certain other specified benefits. So they took away rights and they gave you these rights and they specifically said this is a humanitarian and remedial piece of legislation that is designed to benefit the injured worker. So if you have a situation like this where somebody reacts as a Good Samaritan tries to save another person's life on that job site, it's covered. I don't see the Supreme Court um, changing what's happened in the lower courts. I mean, eventually the other the, the courts did give this man workers' compensation right. benefits, so they overturned what the boss wanted to do. And I and again, the Supreme Court, the way it is structured, I don't think that they're going to make a change. Let me go. Let's make a shift here because we could talk a while on this case. Maybe we'll find out it's an anomaly. Right. But workers' comp fraud does exist, Joe Gill, because you have the tapes. Well, that's true. And there's one thing that we do before we even start the surveillance. And the first thing is we discreetly confirm that they live at the provided address. Second thing we do is we get a list of all vehicles registered there so we can see the position and the direction of those vehicles on the roadway. And the third thing we do is a social networking uh, check. By that I mean a lot of times we have the height and weight off the medicals of the claimant, but we don't really have an, uh, a recent photograph off of Facebook or MySpace or whatever uh, social networking site you want to mention, sometimes that allows us to get a recent photograph. Also, it allows us to see what he's done in the past, but investigatively speaking, more importantly to us, what he's going to do in the future. Well, Joe, what do, uh, give us an example. What do you see out there? I mean, again, there are scores of examples 
on YouTube or Google. I mean, we've seen hundreds of them, literally. But, but give us an example of what you've seen lately where you were asked by the insurance company to go out and investigate. Lately, three days ago, we were asked to go out and put an individual under surveillance who is a known bowler, 63 years of age. He's an admitted bowler. What we did is we found out where the leagues were. I personally went out and observed and videotaped that individual for approximately two hours bowling. Now, again, my job is not to act as judge and jury, but I turn it over to defense counsel who passes it on to the doctors to determine what we see here. Is it consistent or is it inconsistent with his claim? Let's take a quick look, and this, this uh, statistic we want to give you, where this graphic comes from the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud, and here are the three pillars of workers' compensation fraud, according to them. Fake or bogus injuries. Number two, and pay attention to this category, employer scams, you read that right, and medical fraud rings, which could be lawyers and doctors and chiropractors, you know, getting together and, and ginning up a case that shouldn't be there. But once again, Lori, employer scams, one of the big, one of the big three there. Uh, so we, we, we've heard about the fake injuries. We right. hear about lawyers and doctors and chiropractors conspiring. Right. What people don't hear about are employers that don't pay workers' compensation insurance, that misclassify their employees, maybe as independent contractors, that say, oh, well, they have a desk job, but they're really out working roofs. So in your practice, maybe that you don't see a whole lot of that. No, I don't. But it's and out there, and it's let, happening. Let me tell you when I think this happens. You don't see it with the large companies, the large employers. You see it with the smaller employers. I had a situation where I did have to represent uh, a sole practitioner. So he's a contractor and I had to represent him because he was told by the bureau and he's a, he does construction work that he could hire people as independent contractors and and that's what he did. He hired a, a guy for his expertise in construction. That guy was hurt, that gentleman was hurt and he went after the, the gentleman that I represented, the sole practitioner, the lone construction worker, he said he wasn't trying to fraud. He wasn't intentionally trying to fraud. He said, I called the bureau and they told me that I can I'll hire this guy as an independent contractor. And so I find that situation where there may be no workers' compensation that the, the employee didn't. It's in those small companies and where they're, they don't know. And they they're bidding, they're bid, they're bid, and or, or they're bidding for jobs, right. and all of a sudden they're just trying to save some money on insurance. I want to, let's, let's roll in a clip here from Matt Wynn, who again, much like Lori, is a respondent's counsel, because I think some of these matters are nuanced, and then we're going to go to you, Judge, right after this. Let's hear from Matt first. Um, sometimes employees are motivated to not come back to work, and they, they will exaggerate their symptoms. I mean, it's very hard for anybody to know how much pain a person is having, but if, you know, if the MRIs and the x-rays are negative, it becomes a credibility situation. Who do you believe? Oftentimes Judge, that's where you come in, because a lot of these so-called fraud cases may be a little bit more nuanced, as I said a moment ago. It really comes down to a matter of credibility. Sure, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's very hard to uh, determine whether pain uh, is real. We try to look at objective things, such as uh, the MRIs or medical issues. We try to look at claimant's work history. Is this somebody that's worked for a long time? Does this uh, make sense? But ultimately, you know, it is a, a human decision as to whether we believe the, the claimant is credible. And sometimes it, it comes down to the burden of proof. The employer may be trying to prove kind of an all or nothing that the claimant's fully recovered. And the claimant, uh, if they don't win that petition, the claimant remains uh, even if the claimant can do some work, the claimant continues to receive workers' compensation. So it's not like Social Security disability or Social Security where you have a nine-month uh, period where you can try to go back to work at a light-duty job and uh, you can go back out uh, on Social Security if that doesn't work out. Workers' compensation, uh, there is no uh, such thing as uh, kind of a, a trial period for work. So sometimes it is all or nothing. It kind of comes down to the burden of proof and which party has that burden. And judge, I mean, sometimes video is going to make it into your courtroom, but it's not always dispositive, correct? I mean, I think a lot of people say, well, there's workers' comp compensation fraud video. Once that gets in front of a judge, done deal, you know, ball game. 
Not always the case, right? Absolutely, because what we're looking at is, is what is the employer trying to prove? If, for instance, uh, the, the claimant's caught bowling. Well, was the, was the injury a, a rotator cuff uh, injury and the claimant's saying they can't even lift their arm? Or is this a construction worker or somebody that had uh, uh, you know, carpal tunnel or something like that? So a lot of it comes down to what is the injury and also what is the pre-injury job? If it's a, a very heavy duty job, I mean, to be honest, most of the surveillance we see is not dramatic surveillance where we have somebody uh, chopping wood or on a roof or something like that. I mean, we get that very occasionally, but uh, we generally see people doing their normal activities of going out of the house and maybe going to the grocery store, that sort of thing. And that does not necessarily prove that the claimant can go back to their pre-injury job. Right. And I think it comes down to a credibility issue. I think it all hinges on credibility. The insurance company, through their investigator, I've never seen Mr. Gill's work before. He sounds quite competent. I've never had to cross-examine him. But you're looking at credibility. Why do they put that evidence in? To prove that the claimant's a liar. So when I'm representing a claimant and their surveillance, I look at two things. Can my client testify to this in a way that's consistent? You know, I tell my clients, you don't lie. You get up there and tell the truth. So if you went to the grocery store and you carried some toilet paper in one bag, you, you admit to that. I had a surveillance case one time where my client was 50, her mother was 80. They get them coming out of the supermarket with the cart and the drama unfolds as they approach the trunk of the car and they get there and the 50 year old reaches over and she unlocks the trunk and lifts the lid and she turns to her 80 year old mother and the 80 year old mother picks each bag up and puts it in the trunk because my 50 year old client had a really bad back. I played that video. That helped me. I've had similar situations where the video helps us. But you got to go back to the core of the thing and say, what are they trying to prove? And if my client tells the truth, the fact that this guy was bowling, that's not going to ruin his case. If he comes in and he says, I have never bowled ever right. since I got hurt, right. then I think Judge Sheila's right. going to say, I can't believe this guy. And Joe, once you get video, and let's say your client is an insurance company, they ask for that video, right. that's in evidence, right? I mean, let's, let's face it, if they're going to use it for any reason whatsoever, you've got to divulge to the claimant whether that video is good or bad for your insurance company client. Chris, if I could take a step back and just address what George has said. All right, go ahead. He's right. But the bottom line, investigatively speaking, all we're trying to accomplish is get the subject on tape as much as possible. When we're videotaping someone, we're not thinking, boy, this is great, or maybe this is mediocre, or maybe it's the normal activities that someone does during the, during the course of a work day, or a business day, or a weekend day. Our job is get them on tape so the medical people can say yay or nay to the claim. Sure, you don't have, you don't have, a, horse in, you don't have a horse in the race. I don't. And as a matter of fact, if we get no results, we may lose a client, but we still get paid the same amount of money. Right. So we're not, we're not though. a gun for hire in that regard. I don't think they have a horse, but I want to ask, this is what I look for when I ask for surveillance. And the judge can let me know if it's good or not. Sometimes I'm not going to get a person who is a construction worker. I'm not going to get him lifting, you know, a, a 60 pound a tire or lifting any heavy equipment. But that worker might be in comp in, before the judge saying, well, I'll, I can't walk but a block. And when I bend, I can't bend because I'm in so much pain. I'm in constant pain. So if I get a videotape, of him, surveillance of him, showing that he can bend with no problem when he's not in court. He can bend with no problem sure. when he's not before That's a doctor. That's wonderful. That's a beautiful thing. Does it work? I you. think it should work. Of course it does, but here's my question. It hasn't been answered by Joe or you yet, and that is, once you have that tape, don't you have to turn that over and disgorge it and give it to the and claimant? you have to do it very quickly. Yes, I have right. clients, I tell them, I say, if you so have surveillance, you have to, when I know about it or when the employer or the claims representative knows about it. They have mm -hmm. 15 days right. to get it to uh, the claimant. And so once I know about it, I said, you've got to hurry up and give me this tape. Because if I'm not in that window and the, the attorney on the claimant side is smart, he can object to it well, and yeah. it won't be admitted. The other and, thing. and also, if I could just interject for a second, even if the person shows no signs of distress or discomfort, has no apparent limitations, granted, hasn't done anything remarkable, how do we know that that same person isn't going to walk into the courtroom with a walker or some kind of cervical collar or whatever the case may be? <laughs> Sometimes just getting him on tape as much as possible, even if it's not strenuous or athletic, could prove to help us at the time of trial. Sometimes the investigators do get 
overzealous. I have one case where my client was the mother of the bride. She had a really bad ankle fracture and was unable to walk very well. And they still went after her, and they showed up at her daughter's wedding with a concealed camera. They lied their way into the wedding reception, and they took video, and the video showed that the whole bridal party walked down this long staircase except for the mother of the bride. So that helped our case. But I also think, you know, and this may be a little outside the area, but Facebook, for example. I tell my clients, you know, if you put up on Facebook, hey, we had a great time on vacation and we went skiing. Well, did you go skiing? Well, no, I can't. Well, you got to be careful what you say on Facebook because Lori will be all over that. I've done some really great she, things she on Facebook. She does her job. Uh, you know, someone uh, raised an issue uh, before, and I think it was the judge, and it was about not being able to get go back to work and give it a try again. Let me roll in something here from Christian Petrucci, who's a claimant's attorney, and then judge will throw it to you. Go ahead, roll it. If you're on Social Security disability and you want to try going back to work, they'll let you w return to work for up to nine months and come out of work, no questions asked, go right back on Social Security disability. Workers' Comp in Pennsylvania has a 20-day trial period, if, if, if you even call it that. It's Judge, what, do you, what, what about that? I mean, Social Security disability, you've got all these months, but workers' compensation, people should know they've got 20 days to give it a shot, and if not, they have to make a decision. And that's really, I think, the 20 days is coming from when the initial uh, injury happens and whether the employer is going to accept it and whether the claimant's going to go out for injury. Uh, and that is the difference in workers' compensation. Sometimes it's kind of an all-or-nothing game in terms of uh, the claimant going out on workers' compensation. And the employ once the claimant's on workers' compensation, it's very difficult sometimes for the employer to get the claimant off of workers' compensation in terms of burdens of proof. Getting the claimant back to work, they have to send out a notice that the claimant is cleared to return to work. Uh, they have to offer the claimant a light-duty job if one exists within that mm -hmm. company. Uh, you know, so there's all kinds of hurdles the employer has to go through, even to prove that the claimant can work. And then there's a, certainly another hurdle to prove that the claimant's fully recovered. So um, sometimes, as a judge, I have a case where I'm determining whether the claimant's fully recovered or whether the claimant is not. And I'm thinking, well, certainly the claimant could work and do light duty, but that's not before me. The only thing that's before me is whether the claimant's fully recovered. So the claimant might win that case, but really maybe the truth lied somewhere in the middle or the facts lied somewhere in the middle and it was not the decision that I had to make or should make. I've George, a comment from you yeah. and then we're going to get right to your phone calls. I've Go had ahead. situations where my client worked somewhere for a long time, values his or her relationship with the employer and wants to give it a shot. When you have a smart defense attorney and a smart insurance carrier and I say, look, he wants to give it a shot, let's go for 30 days, let's go for 60 days, and if he can't cut it, you're not going to stop his benefits. We'll, we'll, I've had situations like that. It's, it's unusual because usually you have these robot type insurance adjusters who just see a bottom line and bang, they're on him right away. And I think what uh, Mr. Petrucci was talking about was also you could go back to work they could file a suspension, but if you go out within 20 days, then it's a challenge petition. That could also be where they were going with it. Got it. it. Yeah. Okay. Let's get to your phone calls. 1-800-426-4625. We're going to take them till the end of our half hour tonight and maybe for a little while thereafter. Christine from Doylestown, you're up first tonight. What's your question for us? Hi. Um, I'm an office worker, and my coworkers and I often um, go in together and buy sandwiches from a local sandwich shop. My boss asked me to go pick up the sandwiches, and I went to go get everybody's food. I got injured. I slipped and fell. Um, I've been out of work for a couple of days. I feel like it's a worker's comp claim because my boss told me to go do it. It wasn't something that I did on my own. However, he's saying that it's not. Do I have a claim or no? Well, I think it depends on how long you're out. You know, if you're only out for a couple of days and things are okay and it's not a problem, well, then, then it's not worth it. But, I mean, if you had suffered a severe injury, I think clearly if your employer says go pick up those sandwiches for your coworkers and you get hurt, uh, I'll make a very good, strong argument for you if we ever had to file a claim. Uh, I don't know if the judge wants to weigh in on that with a declaratory statement or not. Well, I think the, the, the black letter law would be generally if you go off the premises uh, and you're on break, that's generally not covered. But... If you're directed by your employer, your boss, to do something, 
during your break, that can be covered. So that would be the question if this case came to court is, was the employee directed by uh, the employer to do a certain thing during the break and that was what was being done during the break when the claimant was injured? And she certainly would be eligible for any kind of medical benefits there, correct, Judge? Yes, So, and workers' compensation benefits under Pennsylvania, you're entitled to medical benefits day one, hour one, when you're injured. Uh, the question is whether you're out for more than seven days. If you're out for more than seven days, then you start uh, being able to receive wage loss benefits or indemnity benefits. Let's go to an email question that comes from, I think it's Dave. Uh, can you be denied workers' compensation benefits if you fail the drug test two weeks after you were injured on the job? Does that make sense? Well, that's, that, there's not enough uh, facts in that question. Okay. I mean, is the person still out of work or did they go right back to work? Be denied, be denied what? So I, don't, I think the question's really incomplete. If he uh, was injured and then he went back to work but he was getting medical treatment, but then they have uh, a regular drug test and the employee underwent the drug test and failed the drug test, maybe in that situation he could be terminated uh, for failing that drug test because uh, his termination has had nothing to do with his work injury. Got just you. like Joe, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, George was saying though, I mean, you, you really need to know more about the facts. I had a case just sure. like that once, actually, where the person was fired later after the work injury, but he was fired while on light duty. And we won because he was on light duty when he got fired, and they couldn't prove that his drug use was intentional. He ate a brownie at a party, and he didn't know that it had marijuana in it, and that they couldn't prove the intentional conduct, so we won well, the case. he said he didn't know they had and we couldn't prove it. <laughs> <laughs> the employer couldn't prove oh, that he You're well, suspicious no. right from the start, Laurie. He knows he's going to get Go ahead, Judge. So I think it was Judge or was it Joe? Quick, quickly, the, in that case, the employer generally has a burden to show there was available work. So, but for, you know, that they had a policy that, uh, you know, if you fail a drug test, you are terminated. And but for the failing of the drug test, they had available work, and now the claimant's not doing that work because of failing the drug test. So there's kind of that additional burden. But under the case law, there are some cases that have held an employee that has failed a drug test where the employee, employer had a policy uh, and they had available work, but for the failing the drug test, uh, they can basically deny wage loss benefits. They would still be responsible for medical benefits, but not wage loss benefits. Got it. Uh, we've got, I'm going to get a quick email question in here and keep calling folks because we're going to stay in the studio for about 15 minutes. I want to quit my job and my workers' compensation case is still pending with no settlement in sight. How will quitting affect the case? Quick, George. Well, I mean, is, is the person still on benefits or not? Are they getting benefits? Are they getting partial benefits? There's too many facts, too many moving parts to be able to answer that kind of a question in this context. Gotcha. I now, understand. I see it, if I can hurry up, I see it as I'm working, I'm still in pain, or I think I'm in pain and I don't want to work anymore. Can, do I have to, can I quit and while my case is pending? How you quit is important. Well, we're, and we're going to have to quit here. We're going to have to leave the studio. However, we're going to continue taking your telephone calls. Sorry we only got to a couple. We'll take them after the half hour. Go to our Facebook page, American Law Journal. We're going to be actually uh, filming it from the studio on someone's iPhone here. I want to thank my guest tonight, George Beatty, claimant's attorney with Beatty Sloan and DeGeneva, the Honorable Todd Seelig, Pennsylvania Workers' Compensation Judge for the defense, Lori Carroll with Nolte, Scarlet, Kamaza, and McDevitt, and Joe Gill with Gill & Associates Investigatory Firm in Philadelphia. For all of us here at the American Law Journal, thanks for joining us this week. Until next Monday night, case closed. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Law Catalyst, legal media and marketing for lawyers. Go to lawcatalyst.com. Polanski and Polanski, former U.S. government counsel, representing those seeking Social Security disability benefits. Leventhal, Sutton, and Gornstein, we have your Social Security disability case covered. And the Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media company, and the oldest daily legal newspaper in the United States.